So, what about those creative years? Well, they resulted in the production of plays. Shakespeare is fundamentally a poet, but he is first and foremost a playwright, one of the greatest, obviously. His repertoire is vast, and the best method to help students to keep a clear mapping of all these plays is probably to use chronology, beyond the classic distinctions between comedies, tragedies, and histories. So here on the right, I have provided a chart giving you all the plays in chronological order. Um, however, the dates are not certain. And there are still today some raging controversies about the dates of the plays. Same goes for the text itself. We do not have a final perfect edition of all the plays. There were pirate editions during Shakespeare's lifetime, and there was a posthumous edition, which is supposed to be the most reliable source in 1623, the famous first folio editions. Still, let's try to do a survey. The early plays are full of the eagerness of a man who perhaps has not yet learned the art of checking impulses. Uh, for instance, in The Taming of the Shrew and The Comedy of Errors, it's fair to say that Shakespeare resorts to all the artifices of popular comedy, mistakes, uh, imbroglios, puns, um, bawdiness, stock characters. Um, in other plays, there are other tendencies towards exaggeration. For example, in Love's Labour's Lost, rhetoric is obviously overflowing, so much so that the text is really difficult, and when the play is staged nowadays, very often it's staged with cuts. Um, another tendency in Titus Andronicus, obviously too much gore and sadistic violence on the stage is obviously uh, over the top. Yet there was um, another vein that Shakespeare was able to develop. Those times followed the great victory, the defeat of the Spanish Armada in 1588, and the audiences were expecting patriotic speeches. They were interested in national history. And this is where Shakespeare found an opening. With wonderful facility, he started to write historical plays, these uh, histories. First came a tetralogy, four plays about the Wars of the Roses, including his early masterpiece, Richard, Richard III, and uh, the three parts of Henry VI, possibly written with collaborations. Uh, again, this is not something unusual in Elizabethan times. So maybe, yes, we could have our first excerpt with Richard III. So now I'm taking you to the text excerpts that are available in the course for sure. We will study a very famous passage, the opening speech uh, of Richard III, Act 1, Scene 1. This is a very, very famous scene and many people know it by heart. You have Gloucester, that's the Duke of Gloucester, Richard. He's not yet king. His brother, Edward, is the king. But of course, he will murder everyone and become the king himself. He is alone on the stage and he delivers a monologue. Now, this starts with what a number of critics have called a world picture. That is, a painting of the situation in terms of the weather, of the landscape, but of course, Shakespeare being Shakespeare, there will be a massive amplification and this picture will become a picture of the universe with a metaphysical situation involved. Very soon you'll realize this is Richard versus the universe because Richard is not made for this world he describes. He is in fact the opposite. So let's have a go at those flowing iambic pentameters. You remember, this is blank verse. No end rhymes, but iambic feet. Mostly an unstressed syllable followed by a stressed syllable. This begins, I have to explain, of course, at a moment in time when the House of York think it has won the game. This is, of course, the War of the Roses the Houses of York and Lancaster fighting it out for the throne. 
Now it seems the Yorks have won. Edward is indeed the king. Everything seems, well, perfect. Now is the winter of our discontent, made glorious summer by the son of York. Uh, you see the pun here, son of York. Of course, it's the le soleil de la maison d'York, but of course it's also le fils, that's Edward the king. And all the clouds that loud upon our house, in the deep bosom of the ocean buried. Uh, loud is an old verb meaning somehow to threaten, you see. That would be the best explanation here. Now those threatening clouds, they are gone. They are now buried in the deep bosom of the ocean. This sounds like a peaceful image, but of course... It's already a hint at the natural cycle, because, of course, you know, rain, clouds and storm come from evaporation. And, of course, the trouble will return. The monologue, then, is about, in its first part, about a, an opposition between winter and summer. Winter symbolizes the past, all the wars they had to fight. Summer symbolizes the now situation, this appearance of peace and quiet. So Richard will go through a list of all the things they used to do before their brows were bound with victorious wreaths, avant que leur front soit sain de couronne de victoire. So we have a long list of things they used to do. Bruised arms, stern alarums, dreadful marches. Symmetrically, they are echoed by what they have now become. The bruised arms, les bras pleins de, de coups de cicatrice. Uh, they're now statues. They are hung up for monuments. The stern alarums. They are now merry meetings. And the dreadful marches are now delightful measures. Then you have a personification of war. Grim-visaged war. Grim-visaged war hath smoothed his wrinkled front. Ah, that's very interesting. There is already the idea of appearance. War hath smoothed his face, disguised his face. La guerre a lissé son visage. But of course, it's fate. There's probably something hidden underneath. And now, instead of mounting barbed steeds, au lieu de traire sur d'énormes chevaux de cuirs, to fright the souls of fearful adversaries, he capers nimbly in a lady's chamber to the lascivious pleasing of a lute. He is, of course, King Edward. And now what does King Edward do? Well, he... Capers nimbly, il fait des petits bons agiles. Well, I guess this refers to sex, basically. He's probably having a love session with a lady. To the lascivious pleasing of a lute, even the music is lascivious. But then the monologue changes, and in the second part, a new pronoun crops up. I. You see the opposition here, the break? But I. I is, of course, Richard, and Richard is not fit for this world of peace and love. He is the opposite. Why? Well, because he is fundamentally ugly, morally and physically. Uh, this is semi-historical. Uh, Richard was, of course, uh, a nasty character morally, but he was also, he had the Apparently, he was very much a deformed uh, creature. He had a crooked back, maybe a club foot, something like that. Uh, there was also the story that he was born very prematurely uh, with his teeth and hair already there. And he will describe that. He will discant on that, you know, describe at length. And it will be almost like a rebellion, Richard against the universe. But I, that I'm not shaped for sportive tricks, nor made to court an amorous looking glass. I, that I'm rudely stamped and want love's majesty to strut before a wanton unbling nymph. Oui, moi, je suis pas fait pour uh, 
faire la cour à mon miroir. I'm not uh, in harmony with this world. I'm not ready for this. I'm not made for that. Je suis pas fait pour faire le beau, to strut before a wanton ambling nymph. I, that am curtailed of this fair proportion, cheated of feature by dissembling nature, deformed, unfinished, sent before my time into this breathing world, scarce half made up, and that so lamely and unfashionable that dogs bark at me as I halt by them. You see, even the dogs uh, have this natural instinct of detecting how nasty he is. Well, he will decide to revolt. He will tell the audience that he's going to be the shadow. This is a very interesting theme introduced here, which will be repeated some uh, something like a hundred lines later on, and I have at the end of the second scene, and I have quoted it here at the end, and I'll end my little study with that second mention of the shadow. Because, okay, he's got nothing to do except spy his shadow in the sun. The shadow, of course, is the black double. It's his uh, other nature, and it's, and it's a black one. It's all the evil he hides. Why I, in this weak piping time of peace, have no delight to pass away the time, unless to spy my shadow in the sun, and discant on my own deformity. And therefore, since I cannot prove a lover to entertain these fair, well-spoken days, I am determined to prove a villain and hate the idle pleasures of these days. So you see, he is already determined to destroy this world he's not in harmony with. He will become his shadow. Very interestingly, as I said, at the end of the second scene, after he has actually try to seduce a lady, he will end up mentioning the shadow theme again, and this time he will say, well, maybe that's my best self. I'll be in love with my own shadow. We'll study the last lines here. I'll be at charges for a looking glass and entertain some score or two of tailors to study fashions, to adore, to adorn my body since I am crept in favour with myself. You see, faut que je m'achète un miroir. <laughs> because, you see, I can see myself. And I like myself. And he ends with almost a cry of defiance at the sun. He says, shine out, fair sun, till I have bought a glass that I may see my shadow as I pass. Now, typical Elizabethan thing, at the end of a very conclusive passage, the end rhyme returns, you see, pass, glass. It summarizes everything. Richard is saying to the sun, which is of course the symbol of these new times of summer and peace, huh, I don't mind, shine out, shine as much as you want. You'll have to cast my shadow on the ground, and I like my shadow. I like the evil in me. <laughs> so definitely, Shakespeare is, I'm sure you've realized, powerful. In a very condensed manner, with this little world picture at the opening of the play, he summarizes everything, even the metaphysical meaning of the whole play. An individual against the whole world able to destroy the appearance of the whole world, teaching a lesson to everyone that you cannot trust the world. Yes, sometimes you have balance, you have summer, you have peace, you have love, but there's always a shadow from the light. There's always an individual who, like Richard, will be unstoppable, who will definitely go where he wants to go and will destroy this whole world of harmony, fake harmony, appearance. Right, well, I have tried to give you a taste of Shakespeare. I'm not the best of readers, perhaps, but 
I, I really, I'm really trying to get you to read and make, make the effort. Of course, I haven't explained all the words and some of them are okay, difficult, but with a good dictionary, you should manage. Richard III is not fundamentally a difficult play and there is no language excuse to say, oh, I cannot read Shakespeare, it's too difficult for me. Uh, no, it's not. It's just a matter of getting accustomed to it. Yes, there are the archaic bits of conjugation. You see the third person TH, uh, we've already mentioned that, the ST with thou, second person. But really, these are not fundamental obstacles. There are difficult plays, but Richard III is not one of them. So in the same way, I have tried to convince you last time with our previous lecture to buy a copy of Marlowe's Dr. Faustus. I would say if you want to get accustomed to Shakespeare, a good starting point could be Richard III. Please buy a copy. It's easy to read after a while.